lovely to, to be with you today and great to see so many people um, wanting to learn about Butterflies of London. Um, I noticed some quite knowledgeable people on the uh, on the call today so if there's any difficult questions I might pass them over to you guys. Um, uh, and as we go through this, um, I've included some gratuitous pictures of butterflies just to liven things up. Um, this is a large skipper from my garden in SW9. Um, most of the pictures I'm going to show, uh, well, all the pictures of the butterflies are mine. Uh, most of them were taken with a mobile phone, um, though not this one. And I wanted just to, I did that just to make the point that you don't need to have fancy equipment to take a, 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 a passable picture of a butterfly um, anymore. So this is a talk for lockdown, really, um, amid tales of insect Armageddon and uh, London as a concrete jungle. It's often thought that Londoners have to venture out, out into the countryside, you now the countryside where we keep all the environment to see interesting wildlife. And I'm setting out to debunk these myths. It's, it's simply not true. London is good for wildlife, uh, even in the center. Some species are doing pretty well. And you can see a lot in your local green spaces. So I'm encouraging people subject to whatever the government says to visit the green spaces near you and, and find out what's there. Um, I'm going to be focusing on, on these three boroughs. Does my, does my mouse show on the screen, Holly? If I do that, can you see my mouse there? On? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to be focusing on inner London, which is these boroughs you can see, which border the river. Um, but principally ones with Lambeth and Southwark, which is my kind of my territory. Um, those are three uh, pretty urban boroughs. Um, it's the area um, uh, south of the river. Um, uh, that, that's about 90 square kilometers and about a million people in that area. So it's pretty built up. <clears throat> so before I get going, maybe just a word of introduction about myself. Um, I've had a lifelong interest in butterflies and moths, grew up in Dorset. Uh, been a London resident for a long time, worked here since 1992. Um, I'm active in Butterfly Conservation, the charity that uh, supports butterflies in the UK, uh, and I chair the local branch, uh, which carries, covers Surrey and southwest London. So the part of London it covers is the bit which is um, south of the river and west of Tower Bridge, really. Um, I'm also involved in the London Beekeepers Association, and I spend a lot of my time recently going around the London green spaces, seeing what I can see, surveying, monitoring, and so on, and lobbying people to make those green spaces better. So on we go. <clears throat> this is what I'm going to cover um, today. After a brief introduction, I'm going to talk about what the records we know from back along around the 80s, what was in London then. Um, then we'll see what, what things have changed. Uh, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of databases and charts and so on. I'm going to do mostly from observation. Um, it's very difficult to to really be sure about what wasn't there and what is there now because of um, there are much more recorder effort today than there was 30, 40 years ago. Um, I'm going to use three species as examples. White letter hair streak, the marbled white and the brown argus. Then we'll look at data from other parts of London a bit about moths and a bit and some other taxonomic groups uh, and then uh, I think I want to just do a little bit exploring why things have changed in London, um, talk a bit about recording and then um, talk about what opportunities are kind of called to action, what you can do uh, in lockdown and beyond. Uh, okay, <clears throat> before I start though I wanted just to, to acknowledge the others who are active in London, there's a, there's a whole lot of people doing good work in London. Um, I mentioned butterfly conservation. There are four volunteer branches who cover London. It's the southwest, the, the northwest and northeast and the southeast and the old uh, counties of Surrey, Middlesex, uh, Essex and Kent. Um, we've also got a, a butterfly project, Big City Butterflies, which we're making an application for when all this lockdown ends. I'll talk about that later. There's a whole army of volunteers who've been doing lots of good work. Some of them butterfly conservation members, some not. Um, recording, lobbying, training, chatting, communicating, running work parties and so on. A particular characteristic of London though is the friends of groups. Um, so each green space in London pretty much has got a friends of, friends of Brockwell Park, friends of Burgess Park, et cetera, et cetera. And these groups do a fantastic job um, at looking after those parks, lobbying the council, and communicating to residents uh, about 
things of interest in the park and often that includes the wildlife. Um, London Wildlife Trust do a great job as well and Butterfly Conservation has a project with them down in the Croydon area called Brilliant Butterflies also in partnership with the Natural History Museum. I don't have time to talk about that but I can take questions if you want. Um, the London boroughs I think are doing an increasingly good job and we have regular conversations with the ecology officers who are keen to do what they can to support um, the wildlife in their parks. And the London Natural History Society is a, is a great body that publishes an annual butterfly report and they've got an atlas in preparation to update the one which I'm going to talk about uh, in a minute. So that's a lot of, um, a lot of people who are active in London doing a lot of good work now. Uh, now we'll take a look at historical records in London and go back to the 80s. This is kind of the definitive work, I guess, from that period by Colin Plant, Butterflies of the London area, published by the Nat London Natural History Society that I mentioned before. Um, this, it's, a, it's a really good book about what was known in the early 80s and the pre-80s, pre before that time, about the butterflies right across the London area. Um, and we'll look a bit more at the data in a minute. In the foreword by Paul Wally, um, he said that the number of species of butterflies changed very little over the preceding 100 years, uh, which is quite interesting because I think the number of species has changed in the 30 or 40 years since then. Um, we'll take a look at some of the data now. This is available secondhand at a reasonable price if you want to, if you want to get it. This is one of the charts from the early part of the book um, showing the comparative distribution of butterflies in the tetrads of London. Uh, the recording area for the London Natural History Society is a circle radius 20 miles uh, centered on uh, St Paul's Cathedral, which is, which is just about near that red dot. The red dot I put is Westminster because that's relevant to some of the other um, um, maps I'm going to show later. Um, and this shows, as you can see in the legend here, where there are more than 25 species and where there's less than 10 and so on. And I guess the point to, to make is that in the, in the centre of um, London, there are quite a lot of tetrads with very few species. And I don't know whether this is really because the species are absent or whether it's because there's a low amount of recording effort at the time. There are some pretty good um, entomologists working um, in this period. So I'm sure that um, records are being gathered, but I don't know how systematic it was in terms of covering the whole, the whole area. Um, what you'll see though, of course, is if you get further away from the center of London, you get out into the, into the, into the fringes, um, you start to see more, uh, more records, uh, more tetrads with many more species in, down in, the, down in the far southwest corner, for example, uh, in the south, um, um, and where the London blends into the countryside. Oh, what's gone wrong there? Um, so, Colin Plant lists 22 species in Inner London. He doesn't define exactly what Inner London means in that context. Uh, I use it to mean the, the boroughs in, the, in my first uh, slide. Um, but he talked about 22 species. These are what we would now call uh, wider countryside species. They're not the habitat specialists that require chalk grassland or coppiced woodland or moorland, heathland, um, etc. They, they live in much more general areas. So you can see we've got the skippers, three types of skipper, the clouded yellow is a migrant, and London is quite a good place to see migrants because of the Thames estuary, the brimstone and orange tip of the springtime, the three whites, small copper, common blue, holly blue, red admiral, painted lady, comma. Um, tortoiseshell was common at that time, peacock, um, speckled wood wall. The wall was pretty prevalent across London then, and the gatekeeper, and then these meadow brown small heath so about 22 butterflies were commonly seen um, at that time um, and these are the the um, the records for the three species I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail the white letter hair streak the marbled white and the brown argus and you can see what I've done here is put the red dot at Westminster and for those of you who don't know London very well this is where the the Thames flows from south to north um, so the South Bank at Westminster is actually the, the East Bank, if you see what I mean. Um, and these boroughs here, Wandsworth, Lambeth and Southwark are the ones that I, I was focusing on um, most. 
You'll see that the marbled white and the brown argus pretty absent of records and just this one site for the white leather hair streak here. This is Battersea Park um, and uh, he refers to um, a colony thriving on three mature elms, Exeter elms, um, which is the cultivar of the witch elm in Battersea Park. That colony is still there um, and as I'll show you um, there's plenty of colonies across South London now. So this is what I call my patch. This is the area um, where I'm going to focus most of my talking about. Um, if you can see my my pointer, I'm somewhere about here between the A23 and the A202. Um, and I've labeled some of the green spaces which are particularly relevant. And as you go west to east, Wandsworth Common, Battersea Park, Tooting Commons, Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens, Burgess Park, Warwick Gardens, Peckham Rye, Nuthead Cemetery, and Stayfield Ecology Park. This is about a 10 kilometer square. Um, and you can see the, this is from the Ordnance Survey map. You can see the green spaces mapped out there. There are quite a lot of quite big green spaces. These are, these are sort of 50 hectares plus green spaces here. Um, so there's quite a lot of, of, of opportunities for, for butterflies. And many of these green spaces now have 20 plus species on them in their own right. Um, so I talked about recorder effort. Uh, this is a map showing monads, one kilometer squares, from 2019, uh, where a transect falls within that square. A transect is just another word for a butterfly monitoring walk that attempts to measure the abundance of butterflies uh, along a particular site. Um, and there are over 40 monads here in the north part of um, my, my branch area, uh, which have got some monitoring in them. So I suspect that's a vast increase in recorder effort versus the 80s. And it's very difficult to separate out the effects of increased recorder effort from absence or presence of butterflies. But we do believe there are changes um, in distribution. And just a point there on, on um, distribution versus abundance. I'm talking mainly in this, in this presentation about distribution of butterflies, whether they're present or not, sometimes we call that occupancy rather than abundance of species, which we'd measure by transect walking. Um, so really looking at what's present and what isn't present is rather than how many are present, whether those numbers are going up or down. So two different measures just to bear in mind. Now in Inner London, we've got at least 30 species, maybe more. Um, you can see that we've lost the wall butterfly. Um, that one uh, is it's a national story of loss. Um, people think it's because it was trying, it's trying to put in a third generation and that often, the third generation often fails. Um, and it's now pretty much restricted to the coastal areas and parts of Peak District and so on further north. But we don't have it anymore in London, even though I suspect it could thrive in London if it was able to get back here. Um, the gains we've had, you can see the three that I mentioned, Brown Argus, Marbled White and White Letter Hair Streak. Um, some of these, all of these have been seen in recent years. Some are um, now widespread, even common, like the white letter hair streak, probably purple hair streak. Um, some are uh, very recent, like the brown hair streak, which has been seen, uh, eggs have been seen in Tooting Common, which if you recall, is a little bit um, south and west of um, Westminster. Uh, but the brown hair streak seems similarly to be spreading across Surrey, um, we're finding it more and more and it's been found by folks over in Middlesex quite in quite a lot of places as well now. And some of these are occasional records. I mean, the small blue popped up in Greenwich last year and one, one or two other places. I'm not sure why, because there's not a lot of chalk ground and it likes chalk grassland with kidney vetch. Um, others like the silver wash fritillary pops up occasionally in places um, whenever, whenever there's mature trees and, and sort of secondary woodlands. Um, and you can see the purple emperor in some places as well, if you're lucky enough. So um, all these butterflies are now present in um, in London. And on the right hand side of the picture there, I just show this is a brown hair, uh, purple hair streak egg on oak buds from Barnes Common. Now Barnes isn't actually in inner London, but it's fairly close. But it's one of the ways you can you can now monitor that species. So right now on to the, the specific examples I was going to use. This is the first one is the white leather hair streak, um, which is pretty difficult to find if you're not looking for it, if that doesn't sound 
too silly because um, it spends a lot of its time at the top of elm trees and uh, neighboring trees like ash uh, flying around or just sitting there. So this is, we, we used a methodology which was developed by Liz Goodyear and Andrew Middleton of the Middlesex branch of butterfly conservation um, to assess its, its presence. First thing, to, first thing to do is find out where the elm trees are because the caterpillars only feed on elm. Um, and elm trees are quite difficult to find in hedgerows and woodlands and so on. Um, very variable trees. Uh, so for, what we did is we got um, all the boroughs in London have got databases of the trees. In fact, there's a London tree map as well, which you can access online. But um, the boroughs have got databases of trees and we access those. Um, and then ground truth, the presence of the Hi. trees in spring. Um, because in spring, as you can see from this picture of Battersea Park, end of March, um, the elm trees stand out like beacons when they're in fruit. Very conspicuous at that time of year. We probably just missed it now for this season. Uh, but you can see the elms really easily and tell, get the GPS location, tell which species it is, what condition it's in, whether the crown is visible and suitable for looking, checking for butterflies later. And then we go back in the summer in June, July, and they, typically they're coming out in second week in June in London. I think it was about the 8th of June last year um, uh, and check for the adult butterflies and sometimes do some egg searches in winter, although that is much more tricky. Um, and then just as a thank you to the borough ecology officers, we report back um, what we've found so that they know what's where and can look after the elm trees appropriately. So that's the methodology and, and we've got, now got databases of all the elms across Southwest London. Um, which you can see maybe is a bit of an odd thing to do, but it's quite important for studying this butterfly. And what did we find? Uh, well, this is a picture. This one isn't my picture, but you can just see there by the red arrow. This is a white letter hair streak sitting on a leaf at the top of a tree, an elm tree. Um, the first, first thing that's obvious is that actually there are a lot of elms in South London, many parks, cemeteries, even street trees as well, um, of various types, all types of elm. Uh, there are quite a lot now of the disease resistant varieties that have been planted by the boroughs, partly post Dutch elm disease in regeneration programs um, and also more recently. And uh, most of these elms, or a lot of these elms, have white nut hair street colonies. And if you go to Tooting Common, um, uh, southwest London, big common there, um, there are at least 30 stands of elms um, which are largely thriving and um, there are white hair streaks on, on many of them. Um, and that's probably a, certainly a locally important colony for white hair streaks. Tooting Common incidentally is also full of um, uh, purple hair streaks. It's a very good site for purple hair streaks. Just to mention the disease resistant varieties, the first one was Sapporo Autumn Gold. Um, which was a, uh, that was a cultivar produced in the 80s, I think. Um, and now people are planting New Horizon and, and I'll show you some of that later. So this is a, a map of, uh, it's a picture of a, a white letter hair streak from Nunhead Cemetery, one of those sites I mentioned earlier on. And this is a map showing um, the northern part of uh, uh, Surrey and Southwest London. Um, it goes, you can see it goes down as far as Guildford um, and Leatherhead and so on. So it goes quite a lot further south. But you can see up here in the northern part that these these tetrads, there's almost every tetrad, there's white letter hair streaks been found. Um, uh, so it's really quite prevalent. Um, and sometimes in reason, reasonable numbers. Um, and if you go back to look at data from before 2015, data was only from three tetrads in this area. Um, so some of that will be recorder effort, but I'm sure some of it, some, most of it is down to uh, spread the butterfly spreading. I don't know how the female butterfly knows where the next elm tree is to, 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 to go to lay eggs on, but she seems to know how to do it. Um, this is really a plug for the, the online portal for the butterflies for the new millenn millennium uh, uh, database. Um, if you use that uh, URL I've given you there, um, you can view your own records if you submitted them through iRecord or view all records, create filters. And this is a filter I used yesterday or the day before for white letter hair streak uh, in this area over the last four years. Um, and you can see individual records and certainly most of these in the, nor in the northern, northern part are my records. 
showing how many places um, uh, the butterfly has been seen. And this is almost a map of the elms in the, um, in the area. And you can see in Peckham Rye, for example, there are at least six locations where the white leather hair streak is, is found in that park. Um, this is Nunhead Cemetery where it's found quite widely in there as well. Um, <clears throat> and this is just, um, uh, I guess, a bit of fun really, but this is Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. Um, and um, this is a games area with a stand of 25 or so new, almost New Horizon uh, disease resistant elms planted around it. And the white leather hair streak lives on these in this very urban environment with not much else around. Um, and I show this one because um, if you go about 150 yards to the left of this picture, you've got the MI6 building um, that was destroyed in James Bond, the James Bond film. So you're right close to the Thames and Vauxhall station here in a very urban environment. And yet the butterfly is, is thriving. Now I'm moving on to the marbled white. Um, uh, this one is also extending its range. Um, this picture that you can see is a female on the left and male on the right. Um, it's now seen in, last year was seen in many parks in Southwest London and, and, and indeed North London as well. Um, and um, it's spreading generally in the Surrey area. It's now found in around two thirds of the tetrads in uh, Vice County 17, VC 17, which is the the recording area for Surrey and Southwest London, basically the old county of Surrey. Um, and so the su success in London is partly due to that wider trend, um, but it's also required good quality habitat to be created because the caterpillar likes to feed on things like red fescue grasses. Um, and it's, it's vulnerable in the larval state because it spends such a long time as a caterpillar. You can see in about 11 months of, its, of the year, it's present as a larva. Um, so I think maybe you ought to think of this butterfly really as a, a caterpillar that has a short um, winged phase when it mates and disperses rather than as a butterfly with other stages. Um, so that's, that's extending its range. And as I said, was seen across a number of parks last year. Um, and that was, I think, down to habitat maintenance as much as anything. Uh, this is the occupancy trend for the marbled white over the 30 year period and showing four VC17, Surrey and Southwest London, as I said, shown now in more than two thirds of the um, tetrads. If you want more information on this butterfly and others, then if you go to our website and look at the annual reports we publish for butterflies and moths in the area, you can see charts and data for a lot of the butterflies um, in London and across the county of Surrey as well. <clears throat> now we get on to the brown argus. Lovely little butterfly. I found it last year in Burgess Park, which is a park um, about a mile from Elephant and Castle, two miles from Westminster, um, and on Tooting Commons and other places in, in London. Um, and it was historically a chalk grassland specialist feeding on rock rows, but um, it's now feeding as a caterpillar on geranium species. And that seems to be part of his success because those are much more common and widespread plants and it's able therefore to spread its range and uh, move into London's um, parks as well. So three, three species doing quite well in London, um, south of the river. And the same story is true north of the river. This excellent book published by um, the, uh, the guys from the Hertfordshire and Middlesex branch of butterfly conservation a few years ago has much the same story uh, I recommend it to you if you live in North London. Um, it talks about the marbled white being a success story, and the brown argus now being common across or, or present across Western Middlesex. And it mentions the holly blue, which I haven't talked about, uh, but that being recorded pretty widely across Middlesex. I, in fact, I think, I think that butterfly now you can see almost in any, anywhere in London. I can see it in my garden in Southwest Nine um, regularly. I saw one this morning. Um, and I think wherever you are, you've got a chance of seeing a holly blue now. It really is quite prevalent. But it's also true for moths. I've just picked out four here from my trap. These happen to all have been uh, migrants and now residents. Um, the Jersey tiger was, I think, first seen in, in London about 15 years ago, and it's now pretty common and widespread and flies in the daytime. And we get regular uh, comments about what, what is this butterfly? 
from people with a picture of a Jersey tiger moth. Um, the tree lichen beauty and the toflax brocade in the middle um, we used to be regarded as quite uncommon, but uh, they're, they're pretty prevalent across um, London. Uh, and, um, oh, someone's writing first scene 15 years ago. Okay. Um, and then a gypsy moth, which is a pest in other countries like North, in North America, for example. Um, and it was, um, uh, it was flying uh, in the daytime all across South London last year, um, really quite prevalent. So moths are doing well as well. But don't take my word for it, or even think about um, uh, butterflies and moths. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, I recommend this this uh, website and and um, book to you. Warwick Gardens I showed is a urban park in Peckham of uh, Delboy fame. That's where Peckham is, southwest southeast London, just a bit further east of where I am now. Um, it's a tiny park, four acres or so, um, and you can see a picture of it there. It's a very typical London park. Um, uh, with a play area and a, a community orchard and a football area and a dog poo area and all sorts. Um, but Penny Metal, uh, who's a local resident, did a six year study. She went there most days and she found 550 or so species of insect and spider in that park, some rare um, and some even new to the UK. Um, so it's really a story of, of um, nature under our noses, uh, but we just don't think to look for it. Um, uh, really quite a heartwarming uh, study, I think. So just to summarize where we've got to so far, um, I think many butterflies appear to be spreading their range across London, um, which, which seems to be bucking the trend. Uh, Butterfly Conservation did a study using transect data of um, urban versus countryside uh, trends, uh, or trends of butterfly abundance in urban areas versus countryside, I should say and found that uh, in urban areas they were faring less well than in countryside. Um, there weren't many transects from London in that comparison, so I don't think it really applied to London, but the opposite seems to be true in London, that many butterflies appear to be doing quite well here, um, and there's certainly more species present now than were recorded 30 years ago. Um, and as I said, indications other taxonomic groups are doing well as well. There, I, I pointed out some specific reasons for these changes, for like the elm regeneration or the change of larval food plant for the brown argus, but I think there are probably more general reasons and I want just to have a look at those um, in the next couple of slides. Many of you will be familiar with re this report published last year by the Wildlife Trust and, and publicized very much by Dave Goulston, um, about insect declines and a lot of it was about pesticide use. Um, but it, it, it talks about the main stresses of um, insect declines um, and the man-made causes being um, land use changes from development and, and other, other reasons, but habitat loss, habitat degradation, habitat fragmentation, and then intensive agriculture, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, and especially neonicotinoids, neonics, and monocrop, monocrop practices um, as being very detrimental. It also refers to climate heating as being a problem for insects as well. So you'll note, bear these in mind as I go through the picture in London, because um, I think we'll see that some of these things are less prevalent in London than maybe elsewhere in the country. Um, so the bottom line is, is London is actually quite good for wildlife. Um, people in, a, in all who study wildlife in London will tell you this. Um, there are huge development pressures in London. Um, we know that there is going to be more building. Um, it's already home to nine, 9 million people and that was going to increase quite sharply. So we know it's going to get a denser and taller city in terms of tall buildings. Um, but it's quite green and the green spaces are generally quite stable because they're parks, they're cemeteries, they're gardens and brownfield sites. And many are managed by the boroughs or the Royal Parks. And so the actual footprints of these are not changing very much. What's happening is that the, the developments are getting closer to the uh, perimeters of the parks and the taller buildings are getting pl plonked right next to the boundaries, which can be a problem for shading um, and so on. Uh, but also more people living and working near the parks and green spaces, so you get more footfall and therefore more pressure on, on the green spaces themselves. Um, 
there are a lot of transport corridors in London, uh, rail, road and water, uh, and these make for very good connectivity. Uh, I know that uh, London Natural History Society were looking at the tram link from uh, that goes down to Croydon and what, what how much that was um, a source of butterfly migrations. Uh, if you speak to the boroughs, they use very little chemicals now inside their parks. Um, still use chemicals on the streets to kill street weeds, but in the parks, very little um, chemical use now, uh, partly because it costs money and they don't have much money. So, um, but that's good news for insects. And I think there's been a big change in how the parks are managed. So while the perimeter, the, the, the footprints of the parks are the same, the, you're seeing wildlife areas, you're seeing change of mowing regimes to encourage wildflower meadows, we're seeing different planting palettes being adopted to introduce things like, like um, elms and buckthorns into planting options. I was chatting to the, the manager of the local park yesterday as I was out for my exercise, and he, he's, he's put elms in, in the park. He's talking about buckthorn. He's left a lot of nettles. He's left garlic mustard, all of which are good plants for uh, butterflies. Uh, so a lot more sensitive management. Most of the boroughs now have, have got biodiversity action plans, which they in implement. Um, so I think things are generally getting better. Um, there are problems in gardens, I think, going back further up where people are paving over their front gardens and putting patios and, and conservatories on their back gardens and using chemicals in their gardens. But um, um, so that's a bit of a problem. And obviously brownfield sites, we keep on losing to development and that's also a problem. The other two things at the bottom, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about, but there is a very significant urban heat island effect in London. And there are quite a lot of development controls which can be manipulated to positive uh, benefit in London. Uh, net gain and the urban greening factor. I don't have time to talk of those in detail, but if you want me to, I, I can answer questions on them. And I was rather pleased with my picture of an Essex skipper there taken with my mobile phone last year. It shows what you can do if you've got some patience. That was from my local park. So this is how green London is. Um, you'd be familiar with much of this data, I think. 47% green. Um, a lot of green belt in London, though not all that green belt is of particularly good value for wildlife. Uh, a lot of gardens in London, although again, a lot of the garden area was actually paved over or not very green, or was just grass. But there are a lot of sites of importance for nature conservation, sinks as we call them, wild, local wildlife sites, a lot of local nature reserves, three national nature reserves. Um, and, and lots and lots of species. And if you think about the green spaces, you can see my cursor, you've got the Lee Valley here, Hampstead Heath, uh, the Royal Park, Spattersea Park, Richmond Park, Wimbledon Common, uh, Mitcham Common down here. Um, this is where the South London, London Downs area is. Um, and this is, you've got Greenwich there, Burgess Park there. So a lot of green spaces across the, the, the center, across London, including fairly near to the center. Um, here's a picture which shows how parks are being managed more sensitively from two, two years separated showing a minity grassland and then a wildflower meadow buzzing with insects um, last year. Now I know before anybody says this is a winter picture on the left and summer picture on the right but believe me the was a minity grassland all through the year uh, with pretty much nothing there apart from a, apart from maybe on the bramble in the middle um, but now it, last year was really very good for um, butterflies and I saw a lot of lot of them there. Um, um, I'm not going to talk very much about creating flower rich grasslands but but if you want to go into it I can. Um, it's simpler than some people think um, and it's the key to it is um, uh, reducing soil fertility which you can do simply by by cutting and collect mowing but we'll come back to that if there's time um, on questions later. Uh, in Tooting Common, um, there was an acid grassland restoration project, acid grassland being a, a rare, relatively rare habitat in London and an important one for invertebrates. Um, this is a three year project for restoration. It's now just finished, but the, 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 the local friends group and the park managers are, are taking this on. Um, so that's been quite good. And there are quite a lot of butterflies now coming back to that, that area. Um, I mentioned London's urban heat island effect. Um, just to give you some idea of how big that effect can be, this is data from a while ago, but if you compare High Wycombe in the low 20s temperature here versus the center of London in the low 30s, you can see a heat island effect of around 10 degrees. Um, it's typically, I think, around four degrees. Um, 
it can vary to more than that, of course. Um, but this means that London has um, uh, fewer frosts, warmer nights, hotter days. Um, and I think that makes it um, a benign area for butterflies and insects that are on the edge of their range. Although, of course, it makes it um, possibly good for predators and parasites as well. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so it's not, not, not necessarily a, a universally good thing, but it's a very significant effect in London. That means that species which maybe couldn't survive in the countryside around can do so here. Incidentally, you can see, you can see the gaps here. This green area here is Richmond Park. It's cooler than the, than the areas that are built up around it. Just before I finish, I want to talk, just to mention the Big City Butterflies project, which um, ran for a year in its development phase until the spring of this year. Um, and now we're in the, in the process of putting an application in for a four year project. And we'll do that later in this year if um, the National Lottery Heritage Fund is open again for, for applications, which it currently isn't. But the idea of this project is to inspire Londoners to discover butterflies and moths get them to go out into their local green spaces, um, get them to connect with wildlife, record what they see, um, and really and mindful of the, the well-being benefits of people being out in the countryside, um, mindful that large number, the large percentage of the UK population lives in urban centres and is relatively disconnected from wildlife, so to try and increase that nature connectivity. Um, and um, like many other wildlife charities, butterfly conservation is relatively lower membership in London than in the countryside. And we wanted to change that, still do. And if, this link will take you through to a page which will describe the project in more detail. But we're very hopeful that will restart in the, uh, in the coming year. And in a year's time, we'll have a thriving project looking at London's green spaces again. Um, I'm sure most of you know about I record um, on the left there, but it's available from the app store. It's a, it's a very easy way to uh, identify and record butterflies that you see on your smartphone um, with very little effort, really. But on the right, there's something which is much less well known, which is the butterflies near me. Uh, it gets called an app. It's actually a website that behaves like an app, but you can download it to your mobile phone. And if you've got your location services turned on, it will provide you with a, a list of the species seen in your local area from the, uh, the, the two kilometer grid square um, from the BNM database. That's quite fun to do if you're in a new area, don't know it, uh, just have a look and see what's been seen before. Um, uh, it's not as it's not fully comprehensive because not all the latest records are in there, but it gives you an indication of what, what is seen in some areas, um, which I say it can be quite fun. So just finally, then, in, in, in closing, really, um, what am I encouraging people to do? This is the kind of the call to action. Um, when all this, this pandemic dies down and you get the opportunity to, to guide into countryside, into uh, wildlife more often, um, I'd encourage people to explore their local green spaces. You don't have to go into the National Nature Reserves, the Triple SIs. There are plenty of good spaces near you wherever you live. Um, get in there, get engaged. Um, Submit sightings of what you, what you submit the records of what you see, and when you see things, um, make others aware. Tell us in butterfly conservation. Engage with the landowners and managers about what's there and what they can do better to manage the sites. Um, and there's a great opportunity, I think, in parks and areas, road verges and, and, and places to create wildfly meadows simply by changing the mowing regime, which which means mowing less frequently, basically. Um, and both butterfly conservation and plant life have got projects and campaigns uh, which are essentially trying to do the same thing um, there and and um, those links in the presentation will take you to the websites where you can find out more and i think there's also a lockdown bonus um we've managed neglect at present um the, these pictures i took in the last week on clapham common and kennington park two parks in south areas in southwest london um where the, the vegetation is growing would have probably been cut in normal years, but not this year. And I think for a lot of the species that I've been talking about, um, this is probably quite a good thing. So I think you'll find there's more invertebrates in these spaces and therefore more birds um, and so on. Uh, so I think for one year at least, we may have a slight benefit on, on um, wildlife in, the, uh, in these parks in London. The message from all this is, I think, 
build it and they will come if if we change the the habitats in in urban parks and gardens then the butterflies and other in, other insects will move in um it's, we've proved that um in in london many times and i think that we can we can all do that and we'll do more on that so i'm going to leave it there um remember there's nature under our noses if you only want to look you've got my details there on email and, and twitter if you want to get in touch i'm very happy to answer questions now of course but if anybody wants to connect and get more information or have a copy of the presentation or any more information on any topic then please get in touch and uh, we'll we'll arrange it thank you very much so i should just stop sharing now i think um holly yeah thank you simon we've got a few questions already in the chat great scroll back up i saw from linda earlier okay so linda was asking regarding the 1980 to 86 distribution map how closely do the zero record tetrads mirror the Thames corridor? Um, let me just go back. I mean, I, I'm just going to look at the book. Actually, I've got it in front of me. Um, it's not. No, it's not. It's not really the Thames corridor. I don't think. Um, uh, let me I, let me I, let me just go back to that uh, to check. Well, cause that's a good question. I don't think it's the, I don't think it's the Thames corridor um, that's being mapped out there. No, it, pro it probably is very close to the Thames, but it's probably just because that's where the centre of London is, and you've got things like Westminster, South Bank, um, and all that all that really urban stuff there. Yeah, bro. Uh, we've got James with his hands up. James, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Hi, Simon. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, counting with the heat Ireland effect, um, what is expected to happen in the next years with climate change in terms of the population of, of, of butterflies? Do you think it will increase or, or, or decrease? Um, well, there's some, there's some good naturalists on the call who may have another, another view. Um, I think probably it creates um, in general, I think it's probably good news for the butterflies um, because it creates quite a quite a warm and stable environment for them. I think there are some risks that if um, if butterflies try to uh, put in an extra brood during the year, that can that can often fail, and that's the, the could be another wall brown effect. Um, and you can get phenological changes which are out of sync between butterflies and other uh, and other groups. So. Um, uh, in my local park last year, I picked blackberries on the 2nd of July. Um, and normally I'll be picking blackberries in August, late August or September even. And that's of concern because the the gatekeeper butterfly and others like to use the bramble flowers as nectar sources. But if the flowers have all gone into fruit by the time the butterflies come out, then they've got nothing to, um, uh, nothing to, to feed on. Um, so uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that moths are thriving in, in London. Um, and I think that might be down to the urban heat island effect, as well as the import of exotic species of flower and plant and so on as well. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Great. Thank you, James. Um, we've got a couple of people that are asking about creating flower rich grasslands and grassland management. And if you have any information about that. Okay, I will, I will, in that case, I will I will go back to that slide, which I got probably got time. Yeah, um, I um, It's navigating through the presentation now to find that. Um, where's it gone? Here we are. Uh, pardon me while I try to figure out how to work this. Um, it should be coming through now. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, so this, this um, supposed to be going to slide share. Uh, there we go. Um, this works at any scale of um, land area. So work in your back garden um, or on a park. There are plenty of parks in London where you've got areas the size of football pitches, which could be used, turned into uh, flower rich grasslands um, because they're not used for amenity purposes. Um, but the important thing is that the best grasslands are on the poorest soils because when the soil is poor, 
lots of plants can compete for what's the nutrients sort of which are available um, and the coarse grasses and weeds like the nettles and the docks and so on can't dominate so if you look at that area on the right in the picture which is from Burgess Park um, that's a sort of quality of soil which is good for flower rich uh, grassland areas um, the good news about uh, uh, poor soils is that they live, require less maintenance because they don't grow so much so you can use much less frequent mowing and we've got case studies from from Dorset showing massive savings in in um, uh, management costs for changing from changing the mowing regimes and creating flower rich grasslands as part of this project which is listed at the bottom here but if you're going to, if you're going to do this the, it's not it's not letting the grass grow and um, plant and chucking in some wild flower seeds you've got to make sure the soil fertility is reduced first um, otherwise you'll just get a succession of, of rank weeds in years two three four um, and if you want to reduce soil fertility either you have to scrape the topsoil off which we do in nature in in countryside areas typically um, or you can use a cut and collect mowing regime and here you let the grass grow quite long a foot or so then you cut the grass and take the cuttings away and then you repeat it and that's important because every time you, you all the nutrients go into the into the uh, foliage you take that away you reduce the nutrients in the soil if you leave the grass cuttings on the soil then it just all the nutrients go back into the soil so you can do this over a couple of years over one year it's noticeable effect over two years probably get quite a quite a major effect um, and each time you do it there's less to cut because nutrients are in the leaves and are removed and then use a, a local native flower mix to to seed it with and there are plenty available and I, and I, and I can provide um, I've got a, a PDF I can send to people if they want to to read more about this um, but but soil fertility is a problem in London because there's a lot of nitrogen deposition a lot of nitrogen oxides in the air and so if you, over time soil tends to become more fertile um, just of nitrogen deposition and then then you lose the 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 good plants and get more of the weeds so that's um, uh, flower rich grassland does that does that answer the question adequately i think so yeah and just to let everyone know um simon sent me a pdf of the presentation as well with all the links in so i can send that round afterwards too for those asking i can see oh we've got holly with a hand up do you want to unmute yourself holly and ask your question yeah hi holly um hi. thank you very much simon that was a really interesting talk um i just wanted to pick up on um the increase in recording efforts over the last um 30 40 years um why do you think that is? Is it to do with things like the big butterfly count or butterfly conservation having more of an impact? Um, I think I think there's, there's definitely more systematic recording. So um, we've we've made a concerted effort to put more transect monitoring walks in across the county of Surrey and southwest London area. So when if you go back five years, we we had about sixty monitoring transit monitoring walks and now we've got 130 um, so there's a systematic effect of 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 trying to to monitor the gaps where we were less certain but i think there's probably i think the technology has a role things like i record people find it easier to send records in um, and i think there's probably just more people doing it um, casually um, uh, there were there, there always were um, naturalists going out and surveying but i think there are relatively few of them um, or relatively fewer, so I think there's more people. So it's a combination of effects, um, but I think it's mostly that just there's more people doing it. That's great, thank you. And I think because that's partly because there's more information available online. You used to, before, if you wanted to find out where to go to see wildlife, you you kind of had to join the society, get involved with it, and and become a volunteer and so on. And now you can just go on the internet and see where where can I see X Y Z, and it'll tell you all the sites in a for it you know in, in, in no time at all brilliant yeah and you mentioned i record then someone asked earlier do you use citing submitted to iNaturalist or is it only i record i i think the the um the county recorders who do the who do the the um management of all the records which are submitted um will take records from iNaturalist as well as i record the only problem with iNaturalist is you need to have a photograph 
um, I think, to submit a record, whereas the iRecord you don't. Um, so I think it's more cumbersome to use. Um, it's great. I use iNaturalist, um, particularly when I don't know what something is. Um, but uh, I, I, so I think I, the short answer is yes. But I think iRecord is more commonly used and it's more popular. And it's the background, the the technology behind iRecord is what what is used in the in a lot of the systems now for butterfly conservation and other um, uh, other charity other wildlife groups. So it's kind of the winning application, I think, at present for good or real. We had a question from Faye earlier as well, asking uh, how to get involved with the NHM work with butterflies in the project. Uh, drop me an email, and uh, that's a great project down in the Croydon area, led by the London Wildlife Trust. Um, and if someone lives in the Croydon area, it's actually very, very good for wildlife. Um, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, but just drop me an email. I'm more than happy to answer. Brilliant. Right, bear with me a second. I'm just reading through the chat. There's been a lot going on in here now. Okay. Uh, Maria commented that it's interesting that the Brown Argus switched food plant. Uh, she's wondering how many other specialists are able to do that. And, uh, um, I think it's relatively, it's, it's more common than we think. The, the comma butterfly used to focus on um, the mainly uh, hop and um, uh, elm. And now it uses nettle um, as well because nettles are much more prevalent. Um, it's become much more common. I think that's a simple, I don't know if that's the only reason, but that's certainly one of the factors behind it. And that's an interesting butterfly because it's spreading northwards with, with climate change. It's been, it's now, um, people have calculated it's moving north at a rate of 11 kilometers every year, which is a remarkable distance for a butterfly to, yeah. to extend its range. And it was seen at um, right in the north of Scotland this spring. So um, it's, uh, yeah. Right. So it's, it's not, not all, it's not all losers. There are some winners as well. Yeah, that's really good. Just thought I'd mention there's lots of lovely comments in the chat as well, thanking you for the talk. Um, lots of people really yeah, and Mia's made a comment about the large blue butterfly that usually eats wild thyme has also been seen feeding on marjoram. That's very true. Um, and now there are, that, that, that was a reintroduction in, in the west of England. Um, and now that they've, the, the marjoram feeding populations of large blue are slightly different, slightly later in the season than, than the, than the uh, wild thyme feeding um, populations. So you've got two populations of large blues um, on different food plants at slightly different times of the year, only by a week or two, giving much more robustness to, um, uh, to, for its survival in the future. Thank you, uh, Mia, for mentioning that. Well, uh, Tony, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Simon. That was really good. Thanks very much. Hi, Tony. Really good talk. Hiya. Um, it was a quick question. You might expect it, perhaps, for me. Um, with hymenopterans, particularly ichneumons, that we see beginning to appear more and more frequently, um, are we tracking those along with the butterfly movements as well? I say that because, as you know, ichneumons are an absolute nightmare to identify, going back to the whole issue about mm -hmm. field naturalists and who can do what, where and when. And it's a real problem that we can't necessarily spend a lot of time looking at those and following them as the, we get these migrations and movements or just expansions of butterfly populations. I'm, I'm not really an expert on ichneumon flies and uh, <laughs> predation, um, although, although that is one of the thought to be one of the reasons why the small tortoiseshell has, has, has done so badly in recent years. I know that, I don't know if Nick Rutter is still on the call, but I think he's probably more knowledgeable on, on this than I am. Um, uh, uh, but no, I don't, I don't know, but I think it's important that, that um, the, the predators obviously go, go along with the prey. Um, and just like the aphids and the ladybirds, you know, the holly blues have, have similar years where they're predated and then they will um, do very well and then do badly um, and so on. So, yeah, I wish I knew the answer, Tony. Just more work for us to do. <laughs> Indeed. Well, does anyone else have any other questions? Uh, Nick commented in the chat, so I'm saying, sorry, I don't know either. <laughs> sorry, Nick, I, I thought you'd know that. 
<laughs> Holly, can I give a shout out for the moth thing, if, if I, just in case people have missed it? Um, if anybody's interested, we in the Wren Conservation Group are running a similar kind of event um, on Sunday, which will be on garden moths in East London. And we have the, the wilds of Wanstead Park and Wanstead Flats uh, nearby. So we get some really, you know, very diverse group of moths that appear so 11 o'clock on sunday morning i've put the link up in the chat if anyone wants to look at it great to see anybody there who's interested is that, reco much. Is that recorded tony or not it can be would you like me to <laughs> uh, yeah because i've got i'm on another zoom at that time um but presumably you get some nice migrants in, in, in we that do area. we get we get some super but moths coming through. not my specialty i have to say but but tim harris who who will be mm -hmm. uh, talking on that really good excellent so we'll, we'll get it recorded and we'll put it up on the website excellent thank you yes you could do a whole nother talk on moths of london uh, it's not my not my expertise but um it is an eclectic mix of moths here yeah um, yeah. yeah hopefully we'll be able to get one of those um yeah i don't think we have any more questions if you do please do raise your hand now or post it in the chat if not i think we will start to say well thank you to Simon it was a great talk today it's great to see what's in London I'm um, based in Wales literally in the middle so I never really think of London as being very good for wildlife but it's great to see talks like this proving me wrong um, oh hang on there is one question there from Leslie could you elaborate on the importance of grass species in the wildflower grassland areas does, does, that, does that mean which species of grass? Um, it, so. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really an expert on all the grass species, but um, normally the mixes you get of, of wildflowers will contain the relevant grasses. Um, the way you, you want to avoid the rye grasses and the coarse grasses. Um, most, of, most of the butterflies will, speak, will feed on a range of, of the finer grasses, um, but, if, but I'm afraid I'd have to look up the answer to that one, I'm afraid, Leslie, so apologies. No, don't worry, you're not expected to know everything, Simon, that's fine. Brilliant, right, well, I think we will bring this BMU to an end now. So thank you all for attending today and hopefully we'll see you on some of the others coming up over the next few weeks. So thank you and I'll wave bye at you now. You can unmute yourself as well now if you want to say bye, that's fine. Thanks for coming bye. along. Bye, Simon, bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.